Japan especially will distribute and administer vaccine much faster than other places around the world. If this does in fact takes place, we could see economic growth start to accelerate. We could see some after effects from COVID that we don't understand in the, on the planet in terms of goods and services moving. We could start to see inflation. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Markets Moving. And I am TK Tan, and as always, we have Joe Bodeheimer. Joe, how are you doing? TK, wonderful. It's a little bit overcast in Tokyo. We had a week of very fine weather, but we have a lot to cover today. And today is December 28th, right? It's towards the end of the year, and I think uh, we had a lot to talk about. I hope you had a good Christmas break. We took the week off from doing the podcast, and now we're back. Right. I did. Thank you. Hope yours was, and all the listeners, I hope they had a great holiday as well. So what do you have in store for us today? What do you think, you know, the markets are trending towards for the year end? Is it going to be a normal year end where, you know, a lot of the traders would have deleveraged by now, probably take the profits, mark the market for the year? Is that how it works in Japan for our listeners here? Yes. You know, for a lot of the people that we would talk to and target, a lot of people, as you suggested, the past two or three weeks, I think it pared down positions. They probably unwound some positions in dollar yen. You can see that reflected in the price action in dollar yen. In Nikkei and Topics, we can see there as well the price action. Topics traveled towards 1800 and actually peaked above 1800 several times. But started running into some resistance. And again, we looked at 1810 to 1820 as a key resistance range in our previous podcasts. We called some back in October, November that broke on the way up. We were looking at those and it worked out quite well. This one uh, ran into some trouble simply because there was an explosive spread of COVID-19 in Japan. It went from the three to 400 range that you and I have monitored quite closely to maybe the six or 700 range. And I think there was a period of about eight or nine days where it broke a record each day in Tokyo. So I think that, you know, caused some concern. People have traded well, and a lot of our listeners seem to have done very well, started pairing off positions probably um, the last week of November in the first week, maybe second week of December. And having said that, though, their net flows to Japan had about a six or seven week inflow from November where people across the world have, were focusing on Japan and increasing their exposure to Japan. Now, um, I want to go into a couple of other things. You know, currently we, we see the Japanese market on autopilot, and I think the same can be said for Europe and the U.S. And um, I still think that maybe we'll have some downside. Now, people say, oh, well, you know, look at the U.S. market. You know, the first week of the U.S. market or the January, they say, so as January goes, the year goes. So people are saying if January is robust, the market could go higher. That's happened 82% of the time with a 12.5% gain in the S&P 500. Put that aside. We have an election in the U.S. I think this will impact not only the U.S. market, but markets throughout the world. And there's that Georgia election with two Senate seats. I think regardless of the outcome, I think U.S. markets will go down in the next week or two. I think China is going to be the standout. And, you know, some people might want to look at maybe a bearish view on the U.S. index and a more bullish view on the China index. Um, China, uh, you know, the numbers in China have been consistent. They have been flat, somewhat positive, surprisingly positive in some ways. But the National Bureau of Statistics in China reported the industrial firm's profits, data increased 15.5%. And that's a significant number. There were some questions about Alibaba, you know, an ant group that hit the market. But overall, I think we were looking at maybe in index terms, Japan trading heavy. 1770 was a low and support level was a support level I saw in topics. But again, if it goes, continues lower, the 1720 to 1700 is a gap filling. And if you package all the U.S. information with the election, if you package the China information, net-net, I think Japan and especially the U.S., I think is, is going to tilt lower probably in the next week or two. So how much lower do you think? Well, I'm looking at, you know, Nikkei 225. 
I think we have to monitor, you know, the directional names that we often look at, Sony, Fujitsu, Murata, Kyocera, Tayo, Yuda, and those names. And I think we could probably see anywhere between six and 800 points lower on the downside in the Nikkei 225. That would probably translate to the topics levels. And again, you remember we looked at the 2300 650 level that broke up and it broke higher in November. We were calling that break and then the Nikkei subsequently broke that 2300 650 level and went much higher, a couple of thousand points. I don't think it gives all of that back, but I think we can probably see 800 to 1,000 points lower. Topics, that gap we talked about in November was, you know, around the 1750 level to 1800, which we saw filled on the upside or produced on the upside. But the filling of that gap, as I said earlier in our podcast last week, 1720 down to 17 figure is possible in topics. I encourage you to look at a, a one-year chart in topics and you'll see that gap that I just referred to. And if we do see a pullback in Nikkei and topics, you'll see that gap fill at 1720 to 1700. And even go back to 1990, you'll see this 1800. It all comes into very clear focus of why we talk so much about topics around this 1800 down to 1770, 1720 levels. All right. Uh, so it sounds like, you know, we should be taking a sideline position or do you think it's good enough to also go into a short position? You know, I don't feel comfortable. I'm not that bearish. I think, you know, there's still a lot of money on the sidelines looking to find a home in Japan. The same for the U.S. There's $4.2 trillion looking in the U.S. But I think a healthy, somewhat high volume, robust pullback is in the cards. I think, you know, a lot of people... Do we want to add a lot of risk this time of year? No, we tend to trade the September through January level quite well. We tend to, to find trends and identify them quite well. And we've been quite consistent there and people rely on us for that. But I wouldn't go that far. I'd probably say step back. Some people said they were 60 or 70% of full positions, a pull, you know, reducing to 20%. Some have even gone flat, which I think is a smart move. But, you know, pulling back from 60 or 70 percent of your positions down to 20 percent and have your favorite bullish positions on makes sense. But surely pair some off. That's great advice. Joe, what do you think about, you know, the things that we've been talking about the last quarter itself, which is related to hyperinflation? And the reason I mention it is because, you know, there's been a run up on the crypto, right, um, over the last three to six months. And, you know, gold is still pretty strong, although it's sort of tapered off after it hit, you know, 2000 plus. It's been hanging around the 1800 to 1900 number. And what do you think about hyperinflation with so much money being printed in all these countries, all the major countries around the world to sort of, you know, sort of help with the pandemic? Right. That's a good question. You know, I think that's the the question we must identify not only in direction, but in intensity and then the timing, which is ultimately the key point. I think it might play out this way. We could come into January and February, and I think the narrative might suddenly start to shift to a lot of companies, whether it be China, Japan, a lot of companies reporting robust profits. A lot of these companies, because of COVID, they cut their costs. And of course, you know, they're looking at the bottom line and the top line. But as economy starts showing GDP strength, and China could be quite strong, the U.S. might surprise us with four and a half, five percent strength GDP growth. I think it would be, and I'm just speaking, you know, just writing on the back of an envelope, it could be strong numbers across the board in profits by companies. It could be that economy start to take off while we see bottlenecks or we see shortages in some way. Because one thing that we can look at about COVID, it has disrupted supply chains and it has changed the way everything around the planet moves. And if we start seeing disruptions in, in movement of food or, or goods or services, if we start seeing anything that historically could trigger inflation, I think it'll be surprising. I think we were all prepared for it, but we've kind of taken our eye off of it. And you've focused on that for the last four to six months about the inflation point, rightfully so. What I think happens is we probably see around March or April, imagine if, and I still believe that Japan especially will 
distribute and administer vaccine much faster than other places around the world. If this does in fact takes place, we could see economic growth start to accelerate. We could see some after effects from COVID that we don't understand in the, on the planet in terms of goods and services moving. We could start to see inflation. And it, you know how it is, once it starts to move, it could start to move aggressively. And I think that will be a bit of a shocker to equity markets. I think it'll be a bit of a shocker to countries that don't get their vaccine quite quickly. Now, again, that's a very general comment, but getting the direction of inflation, which is higher, which I think you're rightfully so in the past six months in your call, but I think the timing is probably key. And I think we have to be vigilant and focus on any indicators that would indicate inflation, especially around March or April 2021. Thank you very much for the insight. What about the U.S. dollar yen? Right. I mean, still longer term because of a whole series of a plethora of reasons. We still banks or investment banks are looking for dollar yen to go to 100 or 98. And I tend to agree with that view. But again, for Japan against the yen, it, it's going to have to have a trigger. It have to be a renewed conversation about the trade war with China. It would have to be renewed conversation about an external shock that turns Japan into a short term yen safe haven that we've seen regularly over the past decade. And with that trigger, we could see dollar yen move to 100, maybe 98. But again, that's three to six months, maybe nine months down the road. As we look at it now, in the last week of December 2020, we see that people, and I alluded to this right in the beginning of the podcast, people have been underweight or you know shorting dollars, I think. And I think in the past week, we've seen that if you look very closely at the 103 level, at each attempt to test that level, you see the dollar suddenly firm up. And I think that's people who are not looking at the safe haven conversation about yen because we don't see a trigger for that right now, or we don't see an external shock that would initiate that. People are probably position adjusting, which you talked about in equity earlier, but I think they're doing it in FX as well. And I think people who have been underweight or short dollar yen are buying some of those short dollars back, selling the yen, and that's giving dollar yen some support around 103. And I would probably go as far as saying over the next couple of weeks, probably uh, dollar yen could go to 105 or 105.50. Interesting. Very interesting. Obviously, this would lead to the Olympics, you know, and, you know, sort of the related industries that would benefit from the Olympics itself. What's your take on the probability of the Olympics happening? Yeah, Next I so year. I'm one of the people who thinks that the Olympics will take place. And my rationale is how Japanese behave and how Japanese people as a nation approach all problems and address these problems. And by that, more specifically and precisely, there's talk that the Pfizer vaccine is going through tests and will be approved in Japan in February. So that's just a month away. And what I think the Japanese are doing, and, and you know, they're, always, they're very seldom the first to do anything, but when they do it, they do it right. And what I think is happening is the Japanese government, rightfully so, is watching other countries administer Pfizer product. They're looking at after effects. They're preparing their distribution system, and they're preparing it to do it very quickly, precisely, and they want to be concise with their information, and they want to do it right. So what I think happens in February is there's talk that the 4 million people who are the frontline workers in the country, hospital workers, et cetera, medical staff, they'll get it in February. And then right away after that, people who take care of older folks or older folks, people over 70 will get it. Again, this is what I'm hearing from some doctors here that I, I spend time with. And then everyone else gets it after that. And what I think the Japanese will do, and this is me speaking out loud, knowing how the Japanese people behave and knowing how they tackle problems, I think they'll be very late in administering to the public, but they'll be incredibly efficient and quick in terms of getting it to as many people as possible. Now, what does that mean for the Olympics? Well, it could be around April or May, the Japanese might start producing some comments that say, listen, we've done a, we're way ahead of schedule we can take 30% of the normal volume of Olympic visitors. We can take 50%. I don't know. Again, this is me speaking out loud. I'm wondering how they'll do it. But I still believe they'll have the Olympics. 
Olympics. And I believe that the Japanese will use the Olympics as a showcase for showing their strength and their ability to organize people and not only organize Japanese people, but work with the global under very stressful conditions, but to work with the global community and do what some people, what some Japanese are calling, could be called the Reconstruction Olympics. That sounds great. Um, do you think the, the pharmaceutical companies in Japan, and if you could name a few, would benefit from this? Yeah, of course. You know, I did a little homework and I asked people and they said, well, it'd probably be government organizations that, that administer or distribute and administer this product. But we talked about Astellas and some of the other pharmaceuticals. I think it was 4503, 4502. We looked at those names. I think, you know, we've talked about JAL and ANA. We've talked about some of the big department stores, some of the names that would do quite well. Well, they've all started to drag along the bottom and you know, they're still price searching at recent lows. So as part of our first part of this conversation is, you know, we want to stay away from stocks in general and pull back a little bit, but, you know, getting involved in those stocks would probably be something you want to look at two weeks or a month from now, or after at least the new years. And, you know, still look at cyclicals, you know, look at chemicals, machinery, steels, autos, you know, some people are talking about Suzuki and Toyota still, but I think what we need is some light at the end of the tunnel in, on vaccines. You know, a lot of the near-term information is being priced in quite aggressively, and that does make sense. I mean, you have to look at the current uptick in coronavirus cases. You have to look at the policy responses in the UK, the US, and Japan. There's talk now that Japan could start to inhibit some travel over the next couple of weeks. But you also have to keep in mind that if we we have to be tactical and strategic about this because if the Japanese are doing a great job as we think they are, we could come out of a miserable January and February with an explosive wave of solid information cascading on us about Japanese ability to distribute this much needed medicine. And that would be the time that I, would, again, I would talk to you and I, again, we look at directional leaders. You and I always talk about these names, Sony, Fujitsu, Murata, Kyocera. And then I'd throw in the autos that I just mentioned, or the, we'd look closely and monitor for our uh, listeners, you know, the Tokyos and the Seibus and the Mitsukoshis. Those are a whole list, you know, we, we'll have 15, 20, 25 names, which would include, as to your point, very importantly to your point, the pharmaceuticals as well. So, um, you know, we just want to take a break, look at things now and, and see if we can provide a timeline for these near-term negative points, as we suggested, and try to overlay that with a, a more a medium term and longer term timeline with the distribution of vaccine. And I'm going to record and say this is my final comment, TK. I think in a year from now, we're going to look back and say, and no one's talking about this now, but I think a year from now, we'll look back and we'll see that Japan is the global champions of distributing, testing and checking and distributing and then administering COVID vaccines on the planet. I think they'll be the, the number one country to do that. I think no doubt. I mean, Japan has the right infrastructure, probably the ideal culture for orderly distribution and also, you know, the, the right type of government to be able to handle the, you know, the different stresses that come um, at, at a particular government during these type of pandemic uh, periods. I think that's all the time we have for today. I really appreciate all the insights you've given us. You know, please continue to stay safe in Japan. And, you know, I hope you have a wonderful new year and uh, happy new year to every, every one of our uh, listeners out there. And I hope you had a wonderful Christmas this past few days and hope to hear from all of you at the comments below and see you guys next year. Happy new year from Tokyo, Japan.